so we're live now. Uh, good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. Fourth in this lecture series, in the Colonizing Global Health seminar series, hosted by Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service and the Center for Global Health Science and Security, um, and the, specifically the Science, Technology, and International Affairs Program. Um, as the seminar series is being held as part of these academic programs, uh, we are joined in the Zoom room today by a number of Georgetown students who will be able to ask questions live at the end of the speaker. For those of you watching live via our Decolonizing Global Health YouTube channel, uh, please feel free to add in comments to the chat uh, underneath the video, and we'll try and integrate those into the conversation as well if we have time. Um, please also do feel free to like and to subscribe for future updates. So as we've heard across the last several weeks, the concept of global health as a virtue of its colonial legacies can have an extreming othering effect, separating the global north from the global south in terms of who is deserving of care, how health priorities are defined, and even what it means to be healthy. A further consequence of these types of tropes can also be to overlook the impacts of colonialism in the global north itself, such as the violent erasure of indigenous knowledge um, that occurred as a result of in what is now the United States, in Canada, and Australia, and in other countries. As we heard last week, privilege and power are intimately linked with knowledge systems, and even dignity, in terms of how people and their lived experience are treated within the context of the health system. Decolonizing health, therefore, will also require deconstructing biases and prejudices around how knowledge is generated, how knowledge is valued, how it's applied, and how it's communicated. So tonight, we are extremely privileged to be able to learn more about these topics from Dr. Eli Nelson. He's an assistant professor in the American Studies and Science and Technology Studies programs at Williams College uh, and received his PhD in the history of science from Harvard University in 2018. Uh, in addition to the history of native science, Professor Nelson works on critical indigenous theory, particularly temporality and affect, as well as indigenous science fiction futurism and gender and sexuality. So a lot to pack in there. Before I hand over to Dr. Nelson, um, I want to remind everyone that we are all on a path of learning in this space. Uh, the topics we are discussing are important for advancing equity and justice, but may not always be comfortable. Comfort is a gilded cage for those of us who have the privilege not to face injustice and inequity every day. So I encourage leaning into our discomfort while practicing the gift of grace and of empathy, particularly towards those who may be at different points along their own journey of understanding and reflection. So with that, it is my immense pleasure to hand over to Dr. Nelson for his lecture on Indigenous Knowledge and Public Health. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your invitation. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk about decolonization and public health, um, which is a frame I haven't quite gotten to work with as much yet, even though so much of my work is on public health. Um, so thank you all for being here today, both uh, in person and over YouTube. It's an interesting, uh, I'm still getting used to the virtual lecture. Um, so I do have a number of slides. Uh, so that will be what's on your screen for the most part, um, but I'll come back in the flash, as it were, um, every once in a while to kind of bring us back. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I hope. Can you see my screen? Excellent. So when I was first invited uh, to give this talk, I, I had a number of ideas about what that would look like because so much of my work, as I said, it deals with medicine and public health. Um, and ultimately what I've decided is to specifically focus on the question of decolonization and the medicine person. Uh, I will start by saying uh, that the medicine person is a, a very complicated uh, category um, and public health in general is a very complicated uh, uh, mode of thought for indigenous people, particularly right now. Um, on one hand, uh, COVID-19 has hit indigenous people very hard in North America. Um, many nations have closed their borders, their schools and other institutions for the foreseeable future. Um, and with major exceptions, as I almost hinted here, um, which is uh, the Crow Tribal Council, um, most have uh, instituted CDC guidelines with a greater fidelity than um, most states in the United States have. Um, the, uh, the Crow Tribal Council is notoriously disconnected from actual Crow, uh, Crow opinions, 
Um, but here you see an image from September 14th of 2020 um, of all of them not wearing masks and um, endorsing President Trump. I'm gonna move away from that as much as possible. Uh, in addition to that, however, there have always already been a number of supposed epidemics in Indian country for a very long time. Uh, most recently, uh, there have been what we call the epidemics of indigenous youth suicide um, and missing and murdered indigenous women, both of which um, have been described as epidemics, which is uh, complicated. And many uh, Native Studies scholars have addressed this, and I'm happy to talk more about uh, the expansion of the category of epidemic to um, questions of murder and suicide um, and other social ills. Um, but uh, there is also the question of Indian Health Service and ICE betrayals involving forced sterilization, um, medical experimentation, and a very long legacy of medicine and public health being used as literal uh, weapons against Indigenous people. Um, so as I was planning this talk and dealing with all of these legacies and trying to figure out how to frame public health, um, I was given something of a gift by a troll on Twitter. Uh, I think Claire might have seen this because it was in response to, to you. Um, uh, someone responded uh, saying, I can't see, wait to see what happens to aerospace when we decol decolonize engineer it. This is not an uncommon response. Um, and in particular, it's not an uncommon response from this specific troll who's a notorious um, community member is I think a strong word, but notorious person with a connection to Williams who likes to put forward a conservative agenda which he feels is lacking um, at uh, Williams itself. But uh, I, on one hand, know not to feed the trolls, so I did not respond. But on the other hand, I, I did take this as an opportunity to think more um, specifically about what we mean when we say uh, we're going to decolonize a, a discipline, public health or a variety of sciences, which I work um, in most. Um, so I've decided to focus on this question of decolonization and more specifically this question of efficacy in decolonization. Of course, the subtext to this tweet is uh, engineering and aerospace wouldn't work if we decolonized it because there are uh, science cannot be decolonized. Uh, it is simply a practice that we do and it disappears in indigenous contexts. Uh, and if you think about the question of efficacy and indigenous knowledge and medicine, uh, one of the first people who comes up for me uh, is the figure of the medicine person. Uh, the medicine man, which is often said, but medicine person uh, is really more accurate. Uh, has really been taken up in a number of uh, settler contexts, everything from really terrible Sean Connery movies to medical marijuana and recreational marijuana dispensaries. The one below is called Medicine Man, which is uh, operating out of Colorado, I believe. Um, Black Elk Speaks, who's probably one of the most famous figures, religious figures in indigenous history outside of Indian country, uh, is remembered as a medicine man. And there's a great deal of art uh, and documentation that we see from the history of um, settler anthropology and ethnology, ethnography. Uh, so it's a very challenging figure to track the history of. I, I in fact, invite you to look at the Wikipedia for Medicine Man. It's uh, an, a, a really atrociously bad entry with almost zero citations um, because no one really knows what a medicine man is. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, uh, the first and foremost is that it doesn't really exist. Um, what, what we see is that there is already, uh, they, uh, that not only do they not know what medicine are or were, but they are obsessed with them at the same time. Um, and there's a common mistake because medicine men falls into indigenous categories that uh, make them especially difficult to discuss. Uh, first and foremost is the issue of translation. There are over 500 uh, in nations and medical traditions in North America alone. And the medicine man is not actually representative of any of them. It rings more true for some nations and traditions than others, but it is by and large a pan-Indian myth made up by settlers. Um, not to mention the fact that medicine man, witch doctor, and other related terms um, are, are applied to indigenous people not only in North America, but also South America and Africa, as well as Asia. Uh, so I will be focusing on North America um, and uh, sort of the question in North America, which is also the case, I think, in many places outside of North America, 
um, is sort of this second issue with what the medicine man is or is not, um, which is uh, medicine and medicine people are inherently esoteric in indigenous contexts. Um, not everyone has or knows medicine, um, and the, those that do don't share unless they know that they can. Um, this is the, the issue with sort of the my primary work on, on uh, indigenous knowledge and public health, which is there is knowledge I do not know and there is knowledge I cannot share. Um, so an example of this in my work um, is the you are screen, screen sharing uh, covering up for you as well. Let me see if I can move it. I can't move it. Well, this is Haudenosaunee false face masks. Um, I am Haudenosaunee. I am Gani Kahaga, uh, Mohawk. Um, they also call uh, Haudenosaunee Six Nations or Iroquois. Um, I have a project that I've been working on for quite a long time on false face masks, which are the masks worn by the False Face Medicine Society, um, which settlers were uh, particularly anthropologists, including Lewis Henry Morgan and everyone basically after him, were obsessed with these masks. Um, and the problem with these masks is I'm not allowed to view it, and you're also not allowed to view it, but I'm especially not allowed to view it. Um, which makes it a very difficult object of inquiry for me and something that I honestly probably will have on the back burner for most of my career because I've yet to figure out a good way um, around this problem and I've, I've yet to really be convinced myself that it's worthwhile um, to try to get around it. Uh, but all this to say, uh, there are uh, aspects of Indigenous medicine that I'm not going to discuss here. I'm not going to give many details about what Indigenous knowledge um, is in terms of specific traditions because that's not really uh, my place. That being said, indigenous knowledge and medicine uh, has been interacting uh, with settler knowledge and medicine for centuries now, and there are modes of interrogating it that we can do that are quite important, especially for this question of decolonization. So Medicine Man, as, I, as I'm, I'm sort of saying to kind of sum up, is a composite, partially real, partially fantasy, um, but it is historic, it is exceptionally historically significant and variable. So I'm going to follow um, this figure through uh, indigenous scientific history in North America. Uh, so I'll start with uh, how people have talked about medicine people prior to European incursion. Um, then I'm going to talk about this, the question of indigenous epidemics in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries and the question of lost faith. Um, finally, I'll talk about how indigenous people have taken up uh, biomedicine or, or biomedicine men. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about indigenous medical ethnology. Uh, and then I'll have two sort of case studies um, dealing with gender uh, in the 20th century. Uh, so masculinity and public health crises in the progressive era and feminism and holistic public health uh, in the uh, late 20th century in the 1980s and forward. Uh, and then finally, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll tackle a simple question, which is what is decolonization in the first place? No big. Um, the, the last part will be inherently uh, sort of subjective and, and, and uh, I'll ask more questions than I answer. So the person who is probably oh, talked about um, uh, medicine men or medicine people the most uh, is this uh, guy here, Vine Deloria Jr. Um, who you might have heard of, he's probably one of the more um, prominent and significant uh, Native Studies scholars of the past century. Uh, he worked on religion and politics, and toward the end of his career, uh, he became uh, very obsessed with science. Um, he wrote a number of books attacking settler science, um, uh, uh, everything from um, this book, which looks at uh, indigenous knowledge and medicine and how uh, powerful it was and how it dealt with the question of European incursion and epidemics. Um, but he also has another book called Red Earth, White Lies, which looks at the sort of a broader range of scientific disciplines. And then he got into questions of metaphysics that no one really seems to understand. Um, but he became really obsessed with these sort of undergirding um, uh, structures and frameworks that settlers use in order to oppress indigenous people. So in this book in particular, Deloria collects oral histories on the power of medicine people. Um, and he discusses at length how medicine people were religious medical leaders and visionaries in their communities whose medical abilities uh, were very well adapted to the kinds of illnesses and injuries, um, physical, spiritual, and mental that their communities uh, would have encountered. Um, first and foremost on this question of efficacy, 
Deloria engages with wet medicine people's ability to cope with European introduced uh, diseases and gunshot wounds. In his telling, medicine people had strengths much the same way that settler doctors did. They weren't necessarily less powerful, only differently so. But this, I would say, is the exception in literature on epidemics and medicine people. Um, far more prominent is this narrative of epidemics and lost faith. Um, so there are two forms of scientific and medical determinacy in North American historiography that Deloria's argument is indirectly challenging. Uh, the first was the narrative of, narrative of US and Canadian technological superiority, particularly regarding weapons, leading to the outright overpowering and eventual conquest of indigenous people. Uh, Though it's outside the scope of this talk in particular, I think it's important to note that the historical evidence simply doesn't bear this hypothesis out. Uh, settler authorities in the US and Canada made treaties with indigenous people um, because outright war would have been too costly or simply unwinnable. Uh, furthermore, this superiority could not have been made by the wide margin that it eventually did. And I say superiority, not necessarily in a good way, um, uh, because it took centuries of indigenous, um, excuse me, of settler uh, transgression and moving through the frontier in order to develop these technologies in the first place, which is acknowledged by very prominent settler uh, historians of the West and the Plains, including Walter Prescott Webb, who makes this exact argument that American uh, technologies, uh, including bombs, guns, uh, fences, irrigation, were made through this encounter and this moving forward and the resources um, and innovation that that forced. Um, but the second uh, form of determinacy, the medical determinacy, um, concerns epidemics and the decimation, decimation of indigenous populations. The years leading up to the 19th century, and especially during the 19th century, um, saw an astonishing loss of indigenous life in North America that is evident in the geological record itself. Uh, indigenous bodies, um, it was concluded due to this, were simply not strong enough to withstand foreign diseases. There have been a number of works dealing with this. Most prominently, I'd say uh, David Jones has a book called Rationalizing Epidemics, which talks about these discourses that settlers came up with for why indigenous people died from diseases at the rate they did. Um, of course, this uh, narrative on, on one hand uh, completely paves over the fact that indigenous people were purposefully infected with diseases as a, as a mode of biological warfare. Um, but just as importantly, it contradicts uh, timelines of when they ought to be, and, and this ought to be uh, parsed out carefully. The most uh, devastating indigenous epidemics occurred in the 19th century, when indigenous people were increasingly being held on reservations against their will often disconnecting them from resources necessary for medicine, uh, changing their diets, putting them in extremely unsanitary close quarters, and so on. Not to mention the um, mental and spiritual uh, toll that this sort of change will take on your body. Um, what this did was lead settlers to theorize about the inefficiency of indigenous medicine and the loss of faith that indigenous people must have experienced when their medicine failed. Um, uh, there have been all manner of historical contingencies uh, in settler textbooks uh, that talk about this very question of lost faith. Um, and actually, so just to pause, uh, this is a, a map of indigenous uh, reservations, which you can see are um, quite restricted when you think of a population that covered an entire continent, um, at least at that time being moved into these very small spaces. You can see how that much that would have interrupted um, basically every public health <laughs> measure that these people had uh, in place. Of course, this is not the only case today. A, a, a large portion of indigenous people don't live on reservations, um, but this is very different than the 19th century when indigenous people were literally forced to stay on them by threat of death and incarceration. Um, so this being said, uh, sort of some of the people who have talked about this lost faith uh, uh, discourse um, include Calvin Martin, uh, who wrote this book called Keepers of the Game, which has been completely critiqued uh, to an inch of its life. So I'm not going to critique it so much um, as a, instead of just sort of present it to you, but he argues that indigenous people lost faith in their religions due to the failure of their medicine 
um, and particularly their medicine people uh, to prevent uh, epidemics, which then he argues led to them over hunting in order to participate in the fur trade because they no longer had the moral guidance of their religion because they had lost faith. Um, as I said, it's been critiqued within an inch of its life, particularly in this edited volume, which is just a bunch of people uh, together <laughs> critiquing it. Um, but first and foremost, um, he conveniently forgets that the worst epidemic spread after the height of the fur trade in the 1700s. Um, and so this question of lost faith doesn't again really pan out historically when you look at these details. However, these discourses on indigenous people and public health remain common tropes. We sort of commonly understand that indigenous people were vulnerable to um, epidemics and didn't have the medicine to fight against them uh, without recognizing that this medicine was purposefully dismantled as a, a method of colonial oppression. Um, at this same time, when indigenous people were moving to reservations, uh, science and medicine in the United States, I'm, I'm focusing particularly on the United States, but Canada follows a similar trajectory, uh, were shifting considerably. They were professionalizing, they were transitioning from military sources to civilian institutions like the uh, like medical colleges, like the Smithsonian, et cetera. And with these shifts, in addition to the rise of boarding schools, a dangerous pipeline for indigenous medical and scientific professionals emerged. Uh, one of the most famous is this woman here, Susan LaFleche Picote. Um, or Picote, uh, who is known as the first Native American doctor. Uh, I, in another project, I, I talk about this. There's even a children's book about her, which is really just awful, um, but she's very well known. I'd say she's probably one of the few people where I mention my work to friends who aren't in history or aren't in SDS. They recognize her name because of course she was the first Native American doctor. Uh, so Susan LaFleche Picote, uh, got her medical degree in 1889, uh, two years after Congress passed the Dawes Sovereignty Act, which authorized the federal government to divide communally held indigenous territories, AKA reservations, um, into non-communal allotments for tribal citizens in exchange for US citizenship and the ability to rent or sell that land, which was no small lure for people who were um, not only disconnected from uh, medical structures, but were um, increasingly suffering from lack of food, from lack of money, from a number of other um, issues. Uh, so when she, Susan was, Susan's entire family ended up being sort of the most famous doctors and scientists in different fields. Um, her brother was the first, famously the first ethnologist who I'll talk about later. So she came from a very prominent family and her father is known popularly as the last chief of the Omaha. Um, because he dismantled the traditional Omaha leadership structure in favor of a tribal council. Um, however, she ended up outshining him in terms of prominence, largely due to her work as a doctor. Um, uh, uh, severalty and allotment was one of the most violent mechanisms of assimilation uh, in the 19th century, and it was particularly effective at reducing indigenous land base and severing communities. Um, as the Indian agency physician to the Omaha, um, a position which she was appointed to immediately upon graduating from the Women's Medical College in Pennsylvania, Picotti was tasked with a seemingly contradictory, contradictory objective. Uh, she both had to prescribe allotment to her patients and treat its ill effects. Um, and among which uh, Picotti particularly targeted alcoholism. Uh, Picotti's work in allotment uh, and medical care required that she traversed the reservation time and again, developed, uh, developing different ways of preparing alliatives, uh, palliatives rather, um, and constructing patients uh, at the same time that she was navigating a new way of relating to her land base. Um, this work and her orientation toward land um, uh, and, uh, and addiction culminated in the erection of the first settler style hospital on a reservation, a project that she understood to be her life's work. Um, this is an example of uh, allotment uh, for Susan's family in particular. You can see the list of her uh, siblings as they tried to uh, break up and um, uh, differently distribute uh, their father's land, which was one of his dying wish wishes. It was very difficult. This is sort of the, the easiest to understand image of such. It is a lot of paperwork um, and a lot of grueling uh, family negotiation. 
1914, uh, Susan was uh, very much taken up in a, um, uh, a work, her work on prohibition. She is very well known for uh, inheriting the, uh, the sort of outlook and orientation of her Victorian Women's Association uh, uh, sponsors. Um, however, I think it, her work particularly uh, warrants a little bit of interrogation. So in response to a question she got from, uh, she got during a public hearing, uh, which was what hygienic, physical and industrial effects did you observe from the 18 years of use of liquor on the Omaha uh, reservation? Bacote stated, quote, the Omaha Indians had always been a very moral people. Every individual member of the tribe was required to conform very closely to codes of ethics drawn up by the tribal organization. The prime objective of the organization was to preserve the integrity and unity of the people as a whole. Therefore, we find the Omaha Indian before the advent of the white man, a fine specimen of manhood, physically and morally, of good health and work and rest were properly balanced. He lived at peace with his neighbors, with plenty of for his household, content with his share of gifts from God and more nearly attaining the goal, which is universal pursuit of mankind, happiness. After the advent of the white man with liquor, we find these conditions radically changed and reversed. We find physical degradation of the Indian, the use of liquor lowering resistance to any kind of disease. Listening to this, it is not a radical decolonial assessment of the health of her uh, fellow uh, sort of nationals. That being said, what I'm far more interested in um, is that uh, Evan did in the framing of, of uh, sort of morality and sobriety, uh, she focused primar primarily on community cohesion. The sale of liquor in Omaha territory was a tactic used by white settlers attempting to dispossess Omaha citizens of their land, assuming that the uh, stereotypical drunk Indian would be easier to trick into selling their thoughts. Um, however, uh, this be and this became obviously more prevalent after the Dawes Act. Um, however, her focus has al was always on the question of division and colonization of land. And this was uh, particularly structural to Picotti's um, medical work, most particularly the erection of the first hospital on, on the reservation. The same year that she gave that um, sort of puzzling answer in a public hearing, she wrote a letter to her brother, uh, Francis LaFleche, who I will talk about after this, um, which included a postcard seen here with an image of the hospital, and she proudly described its features. There was a main ward of six beds, a secondary ward of another six beds, a bath for each, a modern equipped operation room, a private um, and obstetric uh, obstetrical room, an office, a diet kitchen, rooms and basement, dining room, kitchen, furnace, laundry, room for a janitor and housekeeper, rooms and secondary store for surgeon and nurses. We have had good success and many good operations. We keep three or four nurses on at all time." End quote. Uh, this structure was really unique at the time on the Omaha reservation. This level of medical support and infrastructure was unheard of in Indian country. Every other physical base for her practice had doubled as something else. She had worked in a schoolroom, a community meeting place, an agency office, her own living room. The hospital was the only, uh, it was only for medical care and it was staffed by numerous employees, some Omaha, others from uh, uh, other white people from the a Indian agency. And it centralized medical care on the Omaha reservation, allowing Cody's uh, successor to avoid the constant mapping, traversing, and parceling out that uh, marked her career so thus far. Uh, more so, the hospital was more than just a first for Picotti. Um, it was the culmination of her various medical and social projects, and it was a culmination of Omaha transition at the time. In Picotti's mind, the hospital was part of the making of a modern Omaha. At the same time, it worked against the allotment impulse to fragment as it provides services for those suffering from alcohol addiction and did so in a way that was community centered, no longer organized around one woman traveling long miles between disparate Omaha families. As a woman of medicine and a medicine woman, Picotti addressed the core spatial issues underlying the supposed inefficacy of indigenous knowledge in medicine at the time. In other words, the figure of the medicine person was morphing and changing to meet the demands of new indigenous spatial contexts. 
as I said, I would talk about her brother, who is one of my favorite figures. I, I, I relate to him very strongly. I spent a very long time in his archive um, at the Smithsonian Archives um, in DC, actually right before the, the Trump election or the Trump, uh, uh, before Trump took his seat in 2016. So it was a very strange time, but his um, papers are just full of his personal letters complaining about how settlers treat him in the academy. And it's, it's very you know, re relatable. But uh, Francis LaFleche uh, was an interesting man. So what I'm going to focus on here is one article that he wrote um, called Who is the Medicine Man? Um, that he uh, was originally a public address given at the dedication of this statue seen here on the right, um, which is still up in Philadelphia today. Uh, it's called the Medicine Man. There's actually a series of Medicine Men statues across the U.S. Again, it's sort of another instance of how settlers really appropriated and were fascinated by this subject. Um, so, in Who Was the Medicine Man, um, Lafleche sort of let a lot of his internal uh, annoyances out. So Lafleche, as uh, a Lafleche, as an Omaha prominent person, had a lot of access to uh, settler anthropologists and authorities. Uh, from a very young age, he was a, a, a considered a native informant for whatever random um, ethnologist or anthropologist was on the reservation at the time, um, and particularly uh, after a certain point in his uh, late teens. Um, he worked with one white woman for almost his entire career, despite, the, and it was continually understood as her translator and um, her native informant, um, despite the fact that he continually complained about that and wanted to get uh, more recognition for being a co-author, which he did eventually get. In 1918, he became, uh, he was the first indigenous person appointed um, to the Bureau of Ethnology as an ethnologist in his own right. Uh, unfortunately, after his appointment, his career, at least at first, didn't go very well. Um, he's known as being pedantic and almost indecipherable in his writing. His books on the Osage, who share a language group with the Omaha, so he, he was uh, particularly good at translating and working with them, are extremely long. Um, every, uh, pre, uh, successive generations of anthropologists have attempted to understand it and have largely said, like, it's significant because these works hold a lot of details, um, but we really can't understand how they're organized. They're organized according to Aboriginal logic. We don't understand it. Um, they don't make sense. Many of his uh, objects that he sent to museums were um, so specifically labeled um, that they didn't really know where to put them because they couldn't fall under like larger categories. Um, so in general, he had a lot of access to grind, excuse me, um, which he did in this paper. Uh, so in this talk that he gave in public, uh, LaFleche faulted missionaries and ethnologists alike for their use of native informants, their assumption that any one person, so long as they were authentically a member of a group, could accurately portray a whole. And he argued that this mode of knowledge production created a childlike and faulty vision of indigenous religions and cultures. Um, and you can see in his own work how he tried to push against this uh, and ultimately failed. In my other work on, on him, I am. Um, look at this through the lens of queer failure, which I'm happy to talk about more, but it's a little bit outside the scope. For our purposes though, I wanna focus on the medicine man person. Uh, so LaFleche insisted that native knowledges weren't recorded in books, um, but they were recorded instead in ceremonies and religious tribal organizations. He claimed that quote, uh, the Indians that lived within the borders of this country knew no written literature. The record of religious conceptions was kept by means of rites, ceremonies, and symbols. Among many of the tribes, as was the case for my own tribe, Omaha, these symbols were embodied in the organization of the tribe itself and in the ceremonies connected to the avocations of the people. In order to salvage that which was believed to be disappearing, Lafleche was particularly interested in the structure of indigenous knowledge, that is the content of a sage ceremony was not as important a basis for comparison or scientific theory, but as a larger uh, unique structure that held a key uh, to the whole of Osage knowledge production. Um, and in specific for, for medicine men who represented this mode of knowledge production, uh, he was especially angry that 
missionaries and ethnologists could not uh, distinguish between actual medicine people and people who were trying to make a buck because there were all these random white people on the reservation um, who got really excited if they said, I can do X, Y, or Z. Uh, and he really faulted these people for failing to accurately um, try to salvage or save the, the knowledge of people who were actually knowledge bearers. He was part of a generation of indigenous ethnologists who did uh, very uh, dearly believe that indigenous people were disappearing, even as he, an indigenous person, was living and trying to record them. Um, so uh, in any case, uh, sort of the ethnologists sought uh, the appropriation of indigenous bodies in salvage anthropology to be slated into settler categories for context and safekeeping. And by safekeeping, I mean specifically settler capital. Um, and he insisted, uh, Laflesh, this is uh, not the key to maintain and produce content. Um, of course, this in a uh, broad sense is sort of the, the, the largest definition of, of indigenous knowledge and public health I can put forward as it dealt with how indigenous knowledge accurately known and recorded uh, and more importantly protected is at the core of indigenous vanishing and survival overall, not in terms of um, public bodies or individual bodies and in health, but the survival of culture. Uh, the medicine person and misconceptions about their ability and connection to indigenous institutions and structures had by the early 20th century been in, in identified as a symbol of indigenous knowledge. So for Le Flesh and many people after that, medicine people became the example of indigenous knowledge producers, despite the fact that they were only a small piece of a much larger uh, context, which included uh, medicine societies, which included religious figures, governmental figures, etc. But medicine people became um, the real uh, sort of priority and symbol. So I'm going to go now into my two um, sort of case studies in public health in the 20th century, both of them dealing with gender from very different perspectives. Uh, the first takes place in the progressive era, um, particularly here at the Kuala Boundary, which is the um, reservation, I mean, more technically it's the trust lands, they had a very particular um, legal existence of the Eastern band of the Cherokee nation. So the, the Cherokee uh, citizens who were able to evade relocation earlier um, stayed in their uh, uh, land base in North Carolina or bordering North Carolina more accurately uh, and uh, uh, designed uh, and were, was able to found their own reservation. Uh, however, around that time, um, there was a major shift in understandings of indigenous health around the 1930s, around the uh, progressive era. The progressive era was formed in a moment of absolute panic on the part of settlers. It was, there was existential financial and environmental crises across the empire. Um, in 1893, Frederick Daxon Turner had heralded the closing of the Western frontier marking the end of US expansion with the 1890 census and an end to all that progress forged on the frontier as a space of, of transgression and innovation. Um, not only that, but this uneasiness of, of realizing that the what made the United States the United States, which was expansion was over, it coincided in the late 1920s and early 30s with a series of catastrophes, including the Dust Bowl and rampant deforestation, a severe economic crash in 1929 and the ensuing Great Depression, and for the contents, context of this uh, talk, more importantly, um, a, a report called the Merriam, Re Merriam Report on Conditions on Reservations. So in 1928, the Merriam Report, uh, which is an in, was an independent assessment of the problem of an Indian administration, which was commi commissioned by the US Secretary of the Interior in 1926 and carried out by the Institute for Governmental Research uh, found that the previous era's assimilation policies had failed to dismantle indigenous nations. The idea was if we push them on reservations, if we educate them as settlers, they will no longer exist. Um, instead, what had happened was these policies had gutted indigenous communities, leaving many destitute and dying, but they were no less indigenous. Um, in the general summary, it reads, quote, an overwhelming majority of the Indians are poor, even extremely poor and they are not adjusted to the economic and social systems of the dominant white civilization. As such, in every metric the report found suffering and inhumane living conditions on reservations. Um, this was especially the case at the Kuala Boundary, the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation's trust lands. 
Between 1933 and 1942, the federal government funneled uh, nearly $600,000, which today would be closer to 11.5 million, into the Kuala Boundary through um, the Civilian Conservation Corps Indian Division Program. Um, hold on, I've lost my place. I'm, I'm getting used to not having my computer to read from, so I'm, 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 I'm uh, trying to adapt. Um, in any case, uh, uh, the Civilian Conservation uh, uh, Program uh, in the Indian Division specifically was about addressing the need to preserve indigenous lands and indigenous people in, the, in one foul swoop. Um, and unlike the Civilian Conservation Corps program more broadly, which sent predominantly white, but um, not only white people to other locations in order to allow them to have the experiences that created US masculinity, um, for the Indian Division, the idea was to allow people to work at home on their own reservations. Um, and it wasn't predominant, it wasn't only men. There was also a, a women's version of the Civilian Conservation Corps that was founded by Roosevelt's wife, but it didn't really work out, unfortunately. But in any case, um, they did everything from soil conservation efforts, road construction, timber sales, plant nursery programs, um, and Indian, Indian Division enrollees were also responsible for operating phone lines, construction vehicles, providing medical care, which is important for our purposes, and overseeing tourism and recreation. Um, and these projects were by and large in line with Eastern Band Tribal Council priorities. Um, at the start of the program, the Tribal Council said this is our, our foremost interest is the health of our forests and of our people. Unfortunately, for Indian division managers and doctors from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, so the non-Cherokee uh, 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 managers, the Kuala boundary was just full of problems. It was terrifying. It was an unmanaged wilderness. It was the site of communicable diseases, non-compliant patients, and unpredictable terrain under constant threat of erosion, mudslides, and forest fires. You'll find progressive era science in general is just astonishingly uh, anxious. Uh, everything must be very seriously controlled. Um, so before they even started the program, their first priority um, uh, was an official health study of the quote, Indians and the Indian environment with a view to establish the diameter and scope of the public health problem. So they assumed first and foremost, there was a public health problem on these lands. Uh, sort of the subtext here, which is only rarely actually stated is that they were expecting a very large degree of sexual tourism when they started uh, building up the reservations. They wanted to make sure that people in North Carolina and elsewhere didn't get syphilis um, was their, their primary concern. Um, uh, the report on, on this public health study stated, considerable interest has recently developed in, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park project, which was happening right next to and on uh, Eastern Band lands. Um, there's been great interest in the park by both citizenry, citizenry and the representatives in North Carolina General, Asse General Assembly from this locality. The population of the park and the extra park zone, which is what they called the Kuala Boundary, includes uh, some 2,800 Indians whose health status and health practices have been such as to cause some anxiety on the part of white residents in this section. It has also been alleged the prevalence of tuberculosis, trachoma, and venereal and other diseases existing among Indians was detrimental to the fullest usage of the park and extra park zone by residents of this section, as well as by tourists and vacationists frequenting in this area, by which they mean they're expecting sexual tourism. Uh, the study that they conducted was really difficult. Um, the entire report seems sort of like a, a pity uh, report on the part of the people who are writing it. It references difficult physical terrain the doctors had to navigate, the extensive cooperation required between uh, different agencies and managing the program, and the trouble in finding a location that residents could or would access, uh, not to mention uh, difficulty in transporting unwilling, or as they called them, unreliable patients. Ultimately, the conductors of the study chose to use the medical facilities at uh, the Central Yellow Bird Day School where an Indian agent uh, would use a bus to transport patients back and forth from their homes. Even still, they were only able to screen less than half the population, 1,115 residents, 174 of whom uh, were white. And we could talk about why there are a bunch of white people living on the reservation. It's, it's a very detailed problem that you can ask about it um, in the Q&A. Uh, so even then though, the patients were a problem. 
many patients were unwilling to give blood and a, a third of those who did not provide enough blood for it to be successfully screened. Furthermore, the report states, quote, some of the Indians could not speak English. Others were timid and reluctant to give the information requested, while still others had very little knowledge of the previous health, previous health status of themselves or members of their family. The doctors sense, uh, and this is end quote, the doctors sense that Indians did not have the capacity to know their own medical history was reflected in the recommendations. From endemic, quote, trench mouth to lack of immunization, the report's authors privileged uh, treating and educating children and being proper medical subjects, assuming that Eastern Band adults were past the point of intervention. Incidents of syphilis in the Kuala boundary proved lower than Bureau doctors had anticipated in that it was not, quote, unusually high. The report noted that 4.5% of the general population of North Carolina at the time had syphilis. At the boundary, 5% of Indian test subjects tested positive for syphilis and 3% of white test subjects did. Given the size of their sample, this hardly constituted a public health crisis. But with these numbers in mind, the report recommended an additional, quote, junior medical officer position to be created at the Eastern Band Indian Agency to fill at the po earliest possible moment by appointment of a young physician having training along lines of public health uh, with particular attention to the control of venereal diseases because it will be necessary to use considerable pressure in requiring regular attendance at the venereal disease clinic. The Kuala Boundary was a space that was conceived of as internal to empire. In fact, the very justification for the study was that Indians were technically on federal trust lands. And yet their vision of the boundary was a place that was needed to be managed and protected against in order to ensure the safety of settler visitors who wanted to cross, the bound, cross into the boundary over the boundary. This public health research and associated measures constructed the bodies of Cherokee citizens as technologies by attempting to create docile subjects of a settler medical paradigm that required their otherness as long as it was contained. The records of the Indian division at the Kuala Boundary uh, are peppered by really strange um, uh, accident reports and frustrations of, of settler doctors, so much so that the um, the, the online version of the finding aid for this, which is at the um, Atlanta branch of the National Archives, um, says that the most uh, interesting part of this archive is the report of a fire um, that happened, like uh, an electrical fire that happened, which actually is not terribly exciting in the context of the reports. But um, it's very, again, very anxious. Um, one of these reports um, happened on July 21st, 1939. Uh, Ralph Owl, who is one of the more prominent Cherokee foremans, included in his weekly report that an Indian division enrollee was, who was, quote, well, first, well versed in first aid, saved another enrollee's life when he fell a total of 200 feet from the top of a waterfall. The enrollee applied first aid at the scene. Later, the injured man was brought against his will to the Cherokee hospital. Um, and refused to sign paperwork uh, uh, attesting to the fact that this fall had even happened. Another case from that year, perhaps the most prominent in the whole Indian Division archive for Kuala Boundary, um, this is the one that's highlighted in the finding aid, concerned a man who accidentally caught fire while operating a truck. In his report on the incident, the Cherokee Hospital physician remarks that it, it was unclear exactly what happened between the time of the incident and when he was finally able to examine the patient. More specifically, he could not reconcile the sensational image of the incident he had been given, a man on fire screaming in agony after a minor explosion, and the patient before him, a reluctant and already patched up patient who was at the hospital only because he needed the physician to make an official report so that he could get his disability money. Around the same time, there was a somewhat less astonishing controversy surrounding uh, enrollee Kodaski Arch's disability claim. Arch was injured on the jo job. He reported the incident, again, under duress, as it remains unsigned, as follows. I was operating the road machine. Uh, I lost my balance and uh, while at the controls, and my left foot slipped between the spokes of the hand wheel, which controls the lowering of the rising of the right side of the cutting blade. The hand wheel and the road machine were both in motion at the time of the incident. My foot was caught by a spoke of the turning hand wheel and became lodged between the spoke and the frames of the rower machine. The doctor who saw him eventually described the nature of his injury as contusions of the left foot fracture the first phalanx of the left big toe and fracture of the metatarsals. 
He was back at work within a week. He refused for many weeks to make an official report of the incident and was altogether an unwilling participant in the whole compensation process. The camp physician assumed that this was owing to some sense of shame. He wrote, the injured man, Mr. Kodaski, Ar Mr. Kodaski Arch, refused at the last minute to sign the CA-1. Since giving us his original report of the accident, it seems some of the Indian men have twitted him and have jokingly accused him of injuring himself on purpose in order to collect compensation. All attempts to reason with him on the matter have been futile. Interestingly, none of the commentary on the case seems to note the two eyewitness reports that document his fellow enrollees providing care for his foot in the meantime. The same can be said for the previous two reports that I detailed. The non-Cherokee employees of the Indian Division and Indian Bureau of Doctors who staffed the Cherokee Hospital were unable to determine why Cherokee residents were unwilling to make use of their services and often fell back on theories of indigenous masculinity or superstition to fill in the blanks. Uh, and this I think is the, the primary takeaway from this uh, episode uh, is twofold. Uh, first, I think it helps us understand how medicine people end up being invisible in archives and uh, settler public health accounts, that care is already happening despite the fact that many indigenous people uh, to this day refuse to go to Indian health service hospitals and other places, not due to superstition or the lack of indigenous knowledge in these places, um, but due to their outright violence um, and uh, often making uh, cases much worse. So indigenous knowledge and public health is, in this view, invisible, but not non-existent. It does still continue to occur and be made and change. First aid is not uh, an indigenous concept. These people are being trained um, and making use of a number of different um, uh, methods and uh, frameworks at their disposal. So the, the second uh, um, case study in this also deals with gender, um, and particularly feminism. I've yet to really address this question of medicine man versus medicine person, which is what I'm hoping to do right now. Uh, how many of you had a chance to read the article that I sent out um, on, <laughs> on Getsy Cook um, and sort of public health, holistic public health? A few people did. Can someone um, just say briefly what some of the criticism of uh, other modes, settler modes of public health and assessment are according to this article? And any of you just raise your hands or unmute. Um, I'll give you guys a chance to respond first. So yeah, please go ahead. I can't see all of you. So if you're raising your hand, just talk. I don't think anyone can see everyone else. So we're, we're all waiting for each other. <laughs> We this can't is see in this virtual lucky. environment. I know it's so awful. It um, really is. Does anyone want to raise your hand in the participant list and then I can quickly look at you and, and facilitate that way? If not, I can give some more some more background and perhaps that will will help bring some well, some ideas up. I'll just say one really quickly, which is Absolutely. that to be this really, I thought it was fascinating that there seemed to be this very, um, the, the story of the toxicologist who came to yeah. visit, who said, you know, oh, it's so great that all these women are, are no longer eating the fish that might be contaminated with these PCBs. And the women are like, but that's our food. Yeah. <laughs> and so having that sort of um, realization that you're actually separating people from their cultural practices through this public health measure. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, so Akwesasne is actually where I'm from. So this is one of the reasons why I sent this out because this is sort of a very uh, home base for me. But exactly. So this sense that um, risk assessment and risk aversion can be conducted without uh, sort of destroying other networks that exist under sort of the settler paradigm is, is primarily what Gutsy Cook is, is talking about. Gutsy Cook and Brenda and all these other uh, is a very long author list. Um, so yeah, uh, Gutsy Cook um, is a Mohawk midwife. Um, she's still alive. Uh, she was one of the original uh, founding members of WARN, Women of All Red Nations. So like uh, sort of 1970s and onward indigenous feminism, 
which was pushing back against uh, the overwhelming sense of misogyny and maleness that existed in AIM, the American Indian movement, um, particularly in regard to medicine because indigenous women um, have historically and continue to this day to be, uh, and, and to spirit and queer people um, tend to be the most um, affected by public health measures, whether it be uh, sterilization or um, uh, loss of children or um, uh, any number of, of other things. In, in addition to this assumption that indigenous uh, uh, medicine and medicine people are inherently patriarchal, which is simply not the case. Indigenous women have been at the core of indigenous medicine for basically ever. Again, this is a, a, a vast oversimplification. It's not the case for every single nation, but it is certainly for the Mohawk context, which is matriarchal um, and generally uh, uh, distributes medicine according to uh, clan dynamics, which are controlled by uh, clan mothers, um, in addition to medicine societies. Um, so Gutsy Cook, um, after getting her degree in chemistry, went back to August Nasse and um, uh, founded uh, the Mother's Milk Project, uh, which predominantly was uh, pushing back against this issue. So as you would have read in the article, Akosnase was the site of one of the most uh, toxic Superfund cleanups uh, in US history. Um, there was uh, upstream, there was a um, GM plant, I think it was GM. Uh, There's a GM plant that had been uh, dumping PCBs into the um, St. Lawrence River for a very, very long time. So much so that a New York, um, New York State public uh, health assessor called Aguasnasi, uh, I think it was in 1889, Aguasnasi was the quote, the worst place in the world to be a duck um, because there were every uh, um, sample that they took from the river was so contaminated that it's uh, registered as contaminated waste in and of itself. Um, so the problem with, with PCBs is that they um, can become, they become more concentrated as they move through um, uh, food chains and as they move from uh, one organism to another. This becomes especially problematic for women who are breastfeeding because if they have PCBs, they're actually um, passing down a concentrated form of that to their child, which means um, eating fish, which is the predominant mode of food, um, became an issue. Then people could no longer fish in order uh, to feed themselves, which again, if you think about the history of reservations, um, being able to feed yourself is, is very significant. We're talking about places that often are, are in other ways, food deserts. Um, so not only is it a question of connection to culture, connection to um, tradition, it's also a question of eating at all um, or eating anything that's not you know, canned or uh, junk food. So the Mother's Milk Project was really interesting. Gutsy um, uh, came back and the, the purpose of this was to test levels of PCB in women's breast milk. However, most women at Aquasnase were extremely um, reluctant to meet with public health assessors and other researchers, predominantly because A, they're just not safe, that the extent to which um, these people will take children into protective custody or um, will in other ways violate you is just very high. Um, but also because these assessors uh, not only didn't understand the context within which they were working, um, but they came in and out very quickly. They never stopped to take the time to learn. So one of Gutsy Cook's uh, major contributions for public health research was this question of the long-term study, that she intimately knew her patients. She did not separate herself from them. She was, in fact, one of them. She's a midwife um, who has children of her own who comes from this place. And so... Her studies lasted longer than many uh, research studies are allowed to for funding reasons and, and, and other reasons. Um, so this is one of her, her, her major contributions. And this, um, this project, Mother's Milk Project, was part of a much broader movement uh, in Haudenosaunee territory and in Ganyakahaga Mohawk territory um, for science decolonization and activism. So at the same time, something called the Aguasnasi Environmental Task Force um, was developed, which did everything from um, sort of similar projects uh, uh, pushing against uh, 
risk assessment and research that's happening on the, on the land to developing education programs, to negotiating with forest services, um, and the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force did the same on a much broader level. So uh, Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force sent um, representatives to the Rio Earth Summit in 1991 to discuss indigenous knowledge and climate change, which is intimately connected to public health. Um, and the other question, so she's part of a much larger conversation about decolonization and public health um, and science more broadly. Did anyone want to, now that I've talked a little bit about the context, want to say anything about that paper and sort of what their critiques were? If you don't want to, it's okay. Okay, well, you can bring it up afterward if you, if you do decide you want to. So this brings me, I, I'm already a little over time, aren't I? Uh, so this brings me to this question of what is decolonizing, uh, what does decolonization mean? What does decolonizing public health mean? Um, it's, it's a challenge. So on one hand, decolonization is not a return to prior forms of indigenous knowledge because medicine, including the biosettler variety, already has indigenous perspectives and histories embedded in it. The story that I've given about um, uh, indigenous doctors, indigenous researchers, um, ethnologists, they, they've been contributing to our understandings of health and medicine and public health for centuries now. So to say that they are separate presumes that indigeneity only exists in a moment of pre-contact. Um, however, there, you do, there is a departure to colonize. It's not simply saying, oh, we're already decolonized, it's fine. Um, decolonization is, as uh, Eve Tuck says, not a metaphor. To decolonize public health, you have to give land back. There, there's ultimately no way to imagine de fully decolonizing public health without decolonizing politically. That being said, um, we still need to exist in the meantime, which we have been doing. And again, this brings us back to this question of efficacy. So the presumption here is that uh, engineering in particular, uh, of course, would just disappear under a decolonial uh, um, uh, context, which might, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very possible it would. I, I think the, the question of whether or not we should do something would have to be brought up. So there are certain forms a very powerful settler science that have been developed through oppression and de developed um, through very harmful uh, metrics that ultimately not, might not exist. On the other hand, um, there are multiple indigenous space projects that do actually work with engineering and aerospace. Um, and uh, for example, um, Kanaka Maoli voyaging has been brought into this discourse on what it would look like for humans to travel into space. Um, so that's not really for us to determine. Um, and I'm gonna stop speaking about the troll now because I don't want make, to make everything about uh, that question. But I do think it's important to recognize the, that the question of efficacy is not just a red herring. Um, it is also one of, of maybe we shouldn't be doing things that are that powerful and that harmful. But more broadly, and what more specifically to bring us back to the question of medicine people. Um, so the medicine person is, I would argue, decolonial already because they appear at all these junctures where indigenous people again and again chose survival and chose against assimilation, even when they didn't mean to. Um, if you can look back at say Susan LaFleche, she didn't necessarily mean to fight against assimilation. However, in caring for her kin, uh, she did manage to help indigenous people to survive. You cannot have decolonization without the existence of indigenous people in the first place. Um, however, uh, uh, part of the sort of preponderance of misunderstanding is that the medicine person is not always visible, nor should they be. Indigenous public health uh, should not always be public. Uh, though they often are, some medicine people are doctors and some are religious leaders and some are other forms of ethnologists who translate and hide when they see fit. Uh, but indigenous knowledge and public health ultimately cannot be disconnected from indigenous people, from uh, medicine people in particular. Um, and I, I'll end uh, just briefly on a note, uh, I think my students are, are might be watching, but so I, um, last week in my critical indigenous theory class, we uh, read an article um, called Indigenous Existentialism and the Body uh, by Brendan Hoku uh, Wetsu, uh, who's a Maori scholar. Uh, and in it, he, he talks about the need for indigenous people 
uh, to stop referencing the, uh, the traditional and the authentic and instead focus on what is actually happening with their bodies in the present moment on what they are, are actually doing. Um, and I think that this actually may help us in our discussion in that it points us away from decolonization as something that's always centered on the colonial to begin with and helps us think about what we could do in the contemporary that's not just pushing it back against the colonial but uh, moving away from it altogether. Um, and with that, I will, uh, I'm done, thank you. Okay, I will attempt to stop sharing my screen. Super, and then I think we can, hopefully you'll see everyone. And so- Yeah, um, that is my hope, stop share. Yay, okay. Yay. Hooray. So any questions or comments or areas of clarification requests? Please either just use the raise hand icon or just raise your hand physically or just unmute and start speaking. I think we're fine with any of those. Initial questions, reactions, comments? We'll just do about five minutes or 10 minutes of uh, questions because we are a little short on time and then we'll um, turn off the, the streaming for, for now. But we have done the streaming Q&A in the past just to make sure that people can benefit from uh, other questions that are asked. So um, I just want, I was just wanting to comment really quickly on this idea of um, medicine people as sometimes unknowable. Um, and I think that's really interesting, especially in contrast to our sort of Eurocentric obsession with physicians as having high status. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if in, in the indigenous people that you know who are physicians, has that tension ever come about? This is a really good question. Uh, I think, yes. I think it's, I mean, for indigenous physicians, it's, it's a slightly different question. So, I mean, this is also, I think, a question in multiple contexts and so not only in sort of colonial settler context, but the post-colonial context as well. There's a lot of work on how physicians occupy this really elevated position. Um, and they do in indigenous contexts as well, just not necessarily public positions, although not always. I, I think this is another instance of, of um, the distinction between indigenous knowledge and indigenous knowledge producers who um, are working in multiple spheres. So m many times indigenous physicians uh, gain notoriety um, in part due to their, uh, for a very long time, due to the fact that there's so few of them. In fact, there, I mean, there are, there are a few indigenous doctors in the broadest sense, unfortunately, um, although we're, we're, we're growing, but, um, and, so, and a lot of times it is necessary in our current uh, day and age and to have a level of notoriety in order to gain resources, in order to let people know that they're, that they're there, particularly in um, urban Indian context, for example, where it's not just a, a centralized place. You need to let people know that there are indigenous psychiatrists and indigenous other indigenous people who can help. Um, so that's, that's sort of one side of it. On the other side, um, yeah, there are quite a few indigenous healers who, or um, medical frameworks who aren't particularly well known um, and they, they don't particularly want to be. So if I return, I'd say this comes up more predominantly in medicine societies um, where indigenous knowledge I think is, is uh, it's understood that this is a context, not just a person where an indigenous knowledge is produced. And therefore, I think there is a lot more um, work on protection and safety and um, sort of keeping indigenous knowledge from being uh, appropriated. And I'd say that's the, the biggest issue. I mean, many, if not, I'd say most indigenous uh, epistemologies and cultures have a, um, an ethic of sharing, of inviting and welcoming. I mean, uh, Henderson authorities would have been uh, more than happy to welcome uh, the United States or Canada as a seventh nation um, if they hadn't decided that they want to colonize everything. So there is an ethic of sharing um, that's been challenged in a colonial context, um, which has, I think, uh, shifted people to a much more protective stance because indigenous knowledge, particularly right now, I, mean, I think we're, we're witnessing a uh, renaissance of sorts of, uh, of appropriation of indigenous knowledge. In the, the 19th century, there was this obsession with um, uh, getting all the indigenous knowledge you could, and then that kind of died away for more stereotypical representations. And then recently, in the wake of climate change, people have again found indigenous knowledge very interesting. Um, 
as a resource to save uh, people from themselves. Um, and so I think there's a, a, a new movement to sort of find a way to represent indigenous intellectuals, scholars, uh, medicine people, um, because we do believe that there's work to be done while well, trying to find a way to not sort of um, objectify the knowledge itself to be taken um, in other contexts where it would it would dissolve. I mean, the thing is the, you can't actually take that knowledge because uh, it, it doesn't work outside of its context. Yeah, and you're trying to commodify it in a strange way and put it into a Western knowledge system where it may not work in, in that exactly. sense. So just um, while the students are thinking up any other questions they might have, we have some um, very positive feedback first on YouTube. It's a great talk to rely. Uh, fascinating. That was incredible, another one. Uh, but we also have a question. So did the health centers on Indian reservations implement an insurance program? How did people pay for the services? Good question. Um, so Indian health services, the reason why Indigenous people are um, so subject to them in a way uh, is because Indian health services uh, do not require insurance for Indigenous people. Um, because Indigenous people were forced onto reservations, um, they didn't really have much of an option for other medical. It's not like you can go shopping when you're on, say, um, the Diné Navajo Reservation, where you're, it's a gigantic place and, it, and you, border towns are, are incredibly violent. Um, so the Indian Health Service is open to, it's like a, a vet, a veteran health services. It's a, a, a specified population service um, that is accessible to, uh, to very specific populations. Um, that being said, I think what you're, you're tapping into is a much broader question of um, how uh, indigenous, how reservations function in terms of um, communal, uh, communal uh, services versus um, capitalism and how these things become enmeshed. Uh, and it's, it's messy. So like on one hand, you have the stereotype of like, oh, indigenous people don't pay taxes and they don't pay to go to school, which is just nonsense. <laughs> um, I, my, my student loan debt can tell you that that is nonsense. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there are, when we are talking about people who are coming from generally non-capitalist uh, uh, histories. So, and capitalism of course is, is kind of insidious and, and contagious, so it's, it's there. Um, but there are also a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, programs and attempts to uh, create communal care and, and uh, options that aren't uh, sort of in the insurance capitalist uh, industrial complex. Yes, which is, yeah, again, not common in other parts of the world as well. So um, quite a uniquely American experience in that sense. Um, so first we'll go to Jessica and then we'll finish, I think, with Shwait, unless anyone else has a really pressing question because we want to respect your time and know we have gone a bit over, but want to make sure that the students get a chance in there too. So Jessica, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Nelson. I feel like I learned so much in this last hour. Um, my question is a little bit about um, data collection. So I was wondering, um, randomly controlled trials are often viewed as the gold standard for data collection um, in the public health community, but this in itself is kind of a Western construct. Um, so when going about disease surveillance and monitoring other aspects of public health um, on reservations to assess public health needs, do you have any suggestions for ethical ways to go about um, measuring public health data? This is also a wonderful question. I think, so first and foremost, there I have a reading to recommend, which is Chris Anderson's work on indigenous statistics. Um, I think you'll find that really helpful because in general, indigenous people in data, there's always an uneasy relationship due to questions of size and scope and 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 also self-identification. Um, so like the if you look at um, records of indigenous populations, you'll see this huge spike in the 1980s and 90s, which is in part because uh, I mean. I, I, if you look at Twitter, there's a lot of threads about how you know Indian people are getting on. But the, on the other hand, it's also due to self-identification. People who aren't, aren't actually indigenous self-identifying. So in general, it's 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 a challenge. But um, other than than suggesting that, um, really, I you know it's 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 t with these questions, which is so well framed, which is you're asking like, do you have recommendations for how to do something better? Um, I think due to my training as a historian, my first, my, my, my mode is just to critique how things have been done before and then say, do them different. Um, but I will say like sort of in terms of, of issues specifically with data, um, indigenous people 
uh, have really struggled with data being used against them. So I'm thinking of uh, examples in the Human Genome Project or genetic testing, where people will take uh, indigenous blood and use it for purposes that they weren't uh, expressly uh, allowed for. So the best example um, is the Havasupai uh, who gave blood to do testing on um, prevalence of diabetes and instead were tested for uh, 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 schizophrenia. Um, which uh, is not good and also potentially dangerous to, to frame a nation that is already strangulated in terms of sovereignty to do a study of whether or not they're crazy. Um, so, uh, and I, I, I say that uh, as someone who, who like wears crazy as a, as a badge of, badge of pride. Um, but I, I think ways to do it better are to not include indigenous people as minorities in data uh, collection, but to recognize that indigenous contexts are unique. And while they can be points of comparison and there should be, because we should be talking about um, sort of the intersections between indigenous people and other and black and people of color in the United States, because there is a lot of um, uh, intersection and commonality, um, we need to understand that indigenous contexts are separate. So that um, data collection needs to be uh, done not only with, um, as Gutsy Cook would say, not only with consultation, but with uh, invol indigenous involvement in the very the planning structure. Thank you. So sweet, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Nelson. Um, so my question kind of focuses on like the creation of the hospital by Susan Laflesh. Um, you were kind of, I guess, if I re remember correctly, we were talking about how that hospital kind of helped to resist assimilation by having a hos hospital like on the reservation itself. But um, I know like hospitals are really like heralded by the West as these pillars of like biomedicine and like technical support. Um, so I'm wondering kind of how that might have taken away from the con that. Uh, that concept of the medicine man, because I mean, I still don't really understand it, but I know like it's not just about like bio biomedicine, it's about spirituality and a lot of other things that I definitely don't know, but I'm wondering, because it's like, it seems like there's such a big, big like push with that. And if, but with the creation of a hospital that like were these other kind of facets kind of shrinking because of that. Another really good question. Yeah, you know, Part of the, the the problem, I think, is that the the work I do on on the flesh siblings, we'll say, um, is in part trying to reckon with the fact that um, sort of these people who are often called the red progressive generation, so red progressive kind of came before the actual the, the settler progressive era, have very radically different ideas of what. Um, indigenous rights and the future of indigeneity should be than we would have today. Like decolonization um, was not the key term. Uh, and in fact, many, including the Ilifash siblings, were complicatedly in favor of some form or level of assimilation because that was a mode of survival. Um, so I think it's a really complicated question of, of how we think critically and generously about what, what our ancestors had to do in order to survive. So I'll, I'll state that as like, I, I think you're right in noting that like some of her work, while you can read between the lines and try to like understand how it contributed to survival, uh, also were contributing to the creation of kind of stereotypically um, uh, settler slash colonial biomedicine structures. Uh, that being said, I think again, context and what the actual indigenous body was going through at the time is what's really important. So uh, the hospital was in comparison to health services being offered either in people's homes or in the Indian agency. And the Indian agency was not a particularly safe place. There's a, a story that Susan LaFleche gives in one of her, her um, sort of, I found it in her archive, it's on like a scrap piece of paper, but like one of her motivations for being a doctor was that she saw an Indian agency, a white Indian agency doctor, like let someone die on the front yard of the Indian agency because they didn't want to let them in because they thought they were drunk. Um, and so I think part of it is that is like pushing against the alternatives, which are just um, not only uh, possibly assimilative, but also like literally deadly. Um, and it's also, I think, how, uh, the, it's related to the question of how uh, 
land and relationships between people were changing at that time. So while the hospital is on one hand, most certainly, right, this, this sort of center of technical expertise and uh, biomedicine, it was on the other hand, a space that was not trying to cut the land and the people up. So it was a place that brought them together as opposed to um, tried to parcel them out. Uh, and so I think that that's the, the aspect of the hospital that I try to hold on to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's complicated. I think that, the, that ignoring the fact that it's complicated is itself a problem. Thank you. I think, yes, um, it is complicated. I think that's a great way to sum up this <laughs> and everything else that has been said. Um, I will just end by thanking you again. Um, really, it's been an enormous pleasure. I certainly have learned a huge amount as well. Um, I hope that you'll be interested in, in carrying on these conversations with us. Um, we Feel free to email. And we're incredibly grateful, again, for your expertise. So um, with that, I'm going to stop the live stream and thank you so much.